So uh, I want to talk to you about one another prayer. And uh, one another prayer, I'm going to have Wanda come up and go through uh, that in a few moments. But I just want to stop. If you have your Bibles or your phones, if you could uh, go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, starting at verse 16. In James chapter 5, it says, Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Sounds like a good idea, right? Not panic, but pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Sounds like a good idea too, right? Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders. And really, I probably, some people define that as only in the office of elder. Just for your understanding, I define that as somebody that's been appointed by the eldership, i.e., life group leaders, ministry leaders, you've been appointed, okay? So you, you are tied to the eldership. You represent the eldership. So it's not just somebody in the office. It's somebody appointed by the office. That's how I'm choosing to interpret that, okay? Call forth the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, actually, another thing that I discovered about that verse is says that that he should call for the elders, it means that the person is too sick to come themselves. Otherwise, why would they call for the elders? They can't get there. <laughs> and so that's a pretty grave condition, isn't it? And the elders are coming out to them rather than them coming to the church for prayer. It says, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. And it says... And then in the next phrase it says, and if, and if. Uh, as I looked into that, uh, I found it interesting that it says, and if. That could also be translated also, instead of if, also, or um, so as much as. In other words, the least that's going to happen in this prayer is that they would be forgiven of their sins. The least that would happen. The minimal. This person is going to get set free if they've sinned. All right? It says, therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. I love what the New Living says. It says, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and wonderful results. I like that translation. I believe that righteous people, when we start praying, should expect great power and wonderful results. I don't believe in, unless we're out of faith. If we're not in faith, then we won't expect great power and wonderful results. If we're in faith, we should expect great power and wonderful results. And so, and then it goes on to say, you say, well, I don't feel qualified. I don't feel like I, I'm that kind of person. Well, he goes on to say, Elijah was a man just like us. So it compares us to Elijah. And most of us wouldn't do that, would we? <laughs> Whoa, he called down fire from heaven, and he saw this and that and all these things. He said, no, he was just like you and I. So that means he had the same doubts. He had the same questions. He had the same, you know, wonderings at times. Is this going to work? He says he prayed earnestly and would not rain. It did not rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed again and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced crops. My brothers, if one of you should wander away from the truth and someone should, from the truth, someone should bring him back. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner away from the air of his ways will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Well, again, we could go into that last part, but I want to just stick with the first part of the fact that that all of us are ordinary people, but we serve an extraordinary God. And just like I shared this morning, uh, the fact that uh, uh, let's, let's, let's make sure we're praying in faith. What does it mean to get in faith? And uh, honestly, there's been people that have asked me to pray for them that if I would get honest with myself, I would say, I'm not sure I can pray in faith with you. Because some people come to me and expect me 
to answer their prayer rather than God. And when I start to pick that up, I get uncomfortable. And I think, what's really going on here? So again, we do have to examine our faith and, uh, and ask us, uh, are we praying in faith? Because this is the, the, the prayer of faith works. It raises, God uses it to raise people up. And we just have to get in faith and be the person of faith to pray. And his prayer is powerful and effective. Effective prayer is not the right words. It's not the right formula. It's not your tone of voice. That's not effective prayer. It's not the right words. It's not, it's not the right formula. And it's not your tone of voice. It's simply saying what's on God's heart through your heart for them. Let me say that again. Effective prayer is what's on God's heart through your heart for them. And when you carry that kind of faith and you put yourself with those people, you'll see greater things happen. And you'll grow in confidence. Because you'll see one thing happen, and you'll see two things happen, and you'll see three things happen, and you'll see four things happen. And you go, wait a minute, the fifth thing that happened is the most challenging thing that I've ever seen in my life. But I recall when God answered one, and he answered two, and he answered three, and he answered four. He's going to move in five. And so we've got to build this track record with God in faith. And so we get to the bigger things, the greater things, the scarier things, that we actually reach back and remember what he did before and build, say, God, do it again. That's praying in faith. And it's powerful when we grow in that way. Every time that we pray for the sick in a public setting like we did this morning, I fully expect that people will be healed. There was a time as a pastor that I didn't know that. I didn't have the confidence to believe. Now I am absolutely certain that at least two, three, or four out of a dozen that God's going to change something. I just, I, I, why is that? It's not arrogance. I've seen the track record of God. I've seen the track record of God. And so there's no reason for me not to doubt he won't do it again at that moment. So let's just, one another praying, think about our consistent prayer. And uh, the, the other thing that I want to just challenge you with is I believe effective prayer is measurable. Lots of times we pray prayers that aren't measurable. Uh, you know, oh God, change the city, or whatever. Well, how are you going to measure that? And some, oh God, change China. Oh God, change North Korea. Okay, it's, the, the heart's there, but how are you going to measure that? Oh God, when these leaders meet, I want them to come to a conclusion that they wouldn't make on their own, but because I'm praying and believing that you would enter into that summit, that you would change their minds, that they would come out with a different decision that would be good for their people and good for the world. You can measure that rather than saying, oh God, just change the nation. So I really encourage you when you begin to pray, ask yourself, is this a measurable prayer? Because when when the, when the prayer is measurable, you'll get results and you'll grow from those results because it's measurable. I believe God wants us to have measurable prayers. And, he, and sometimes we just scatter prayers over and then we don't see the results and we say, why pray? Maybe we didn't make it measurable enough. Let's get specific with God. And he wants to speak to us. All right. I've asked Wanda to come up and kind of go through this, uh, this, uh, this, this particular model, or not, it's not a model, this particular way of praying is in the context of small groups. There's a different, similar, when we pray here on Sunday morning, and uh, Mike Hoffman actually sent out to those that pray on Sunday morning, the prayer team, kind of an update. He did a great job. I don't know if Carol was involved in that or not, but did a great job, a little bit, she says great job of just updating us on the prayer model up here, but I want to go over praying for one another in a group, and how is that done? In a few minutes, we're going to practice together, so get ready. It's going to be awesome, because what we teach, we want to practice, 
And so, Wanda, would you come and, and go through that? And uh, I've got, here, got handouts. Okay. The ministry that Bobby and I uh, started in years ago in Broadway, this, this one another prayer was very key and instrumental for us. It had a huge impact on us as leaders. Um, to see the gifts of the Spirit operating fully, the body, everyone participating, hearing God, seeing God move, uh, even just praying for one person. Um, and so this has always been a, a core. Whenever we think about small groups, to me, this is what a small group can do. It's really this one another ministry. And so these are just some very practical things in terms of how to facilitate what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And a lot of it might be a reminder, but just uh, a fresh look at it. Um, it says to first identify a need. And, and obviously, when you take time to do this, uh, I know it, I don't know where it says here. Uh, oftentimes, if you're a small group leader, don't worry that not everyone's going to get prayed for. What we have seen over the long haul is that in a group, there's probably one or two people that the Lord, he just has his hand on that particular week. Um, you know, because as a small group leader, you feel the burden that we need to pray for everybody. Everybody, you know, needs to share their heart. You know how that goes. You know, it, it goes on and on, and then it's just kind of scattered. Uh, but when the Holy Spirit, when you really invite him in and it gets focused, everyone gets blessed because God starts to move, and, and you see some things happen. So even when you come into that group, it might even be through the icebreaker that you can begin to pick up. Always be looking, even as that group starts, God, who is your hand on tonight that you really want to do some special things in, you know, that we, we want to pray for them. Um, so once you identify that, you know, go into a time of prayer, either asking, you know, uh, and you may even discern that and say, hey, I just really sense, you know, that we need to pray for you tonight. You know, don't be afraid to take that initiative um, or to, to invite a, a person or two. And, of course, you know, some groups will call it the hot seat, you know, the hot chair that you put in the middle. That's how we used to do it. You know, it would be in the middle of the room, and you get to sit in the hot chair. Um, but that actually became a very coveted seat. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit moved so mightily through it. So, uh, you know, it wasn't the, the chair of shame. It was the Holy Spirit uh, seat where we were, uh, wanted to honor that person and, and invite the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it just simply facilitates people coming around them, too. It, it depends upon your setting. Uh, but when you identify that person, invite them to, to uh, either come to the chair or make it accessible for others to come. And... Uh, when you want to identify a need, sometimes the need may have already been presented in what they shared earlier. Uh, but if not, you just want to give a little bit of a time to identify the specific need. And this is where you might need to be a little assertive in your leadership. Some people, they need you to know all the details, okay? Uh, and you don't want that. You might want to just remind them, you know, can you just remind us of the, the context? And just to say, you know, we don't need to know all the details. Uh, you know, just on a side note, if you really want prophetic prayer, there are times where purposely I will say, I, I don't want to know anything. Let's just see what God would want to do. And this might not be in the, in the context of a specific need that you know is present. But oftentimes, it's really fun just to say, we're just going to pray for you. Don't say anything. Let's just see what God has. And then it's really exciting to see what, what God uh, shows you. Uh, but give them an opportunity just to say in a, in a minute. If, if you have three minutes, say a minute, because they'll take three. They always take double what you give them. Count on it, okay? This goes for testimonies too, leaders. You can model it well. When we give you two minutes, we mean two minutes. Um, anyway, sorry. Uh, did you give me a time limit for this? <laughs> I just realized he, he's saying, oh, no, I didn't. Okay, so you identify the need, uh, then you gather around, uh, and in terms of laying hands, just a reminder, at the very least, when you lay hands on a, on a person, obviously it can be a sign of support. Be sensitive to an individual. Some people, they can get a little claustrophobic. You know, be careful not to uh, suffocate them, okay? But it can be, you know, and it doesn't have to be everybody, but just a, as a sign of support. But also remember that laying on of hands, there is a spiritual impartation. That's really the biblical context of laying on of hands. It's not just a, oh, you know, I support you. No, there is a grace that you are imparting. So I say that because there may be uh, this faith element, especially if it's healing or something. 
uh, you might want to just remind the group, you know, if, if you have a strong sense of faith for this person, I encourage you to come and lay hands and just share that faith with them. Impart that just through your laying on of hands. Highlight the importance of that because it's very powerful. That's why we lay hands, and it has to do with that faith uh, that God may give an individual in your group for another person and just honor that. And so when you uh, lay hands and you just begin to pray, just remind everyone, let's just wait a minute. Uh, you know, and let's just, uh, you can even start, let's just start thanking the Lord for a minute before we start to pray. You know, and, and just spontaneously uh, thank him and praise him. And then you might want to say, let's just pause for a moment and just listen to what Holy Spirit might want to drop, you know, in your spirit. Because here again, it's an invitation for the gifts to be activated. Uh, it may be, and you might want to just remind them, you know, some of you might even get a picture Maybe some of you might get a word. Let's just see what the Lord might, might give you. You know, you're kind of nurturing and, and encouraging people to expect God may give them something that they didn't come in with. And so you, you pause, um, and then you just begin to pray. And obviously, it's great to have the word there as well. If someone, maybe the Lord has given you a scripture that you just want to pray over this individual. You know, you want to open up all kinds of possibilities um, it says here to keep your eyes open when you, when you pray. Uh, that can be important because uh, the Holy Spirit may manifest. There may be things that you are praying, and by that person's response, it's like you hit something. You know, it's like all of a sudden they just start crying. Uh, or you can even visibly see they're starting to shake. Obviously, something's happening. Pay attention to that because, you know, sometimes the prayer, there really may be something that the Lord specifically wants to say and you really want to give room for that. So just be alert to that as a leader. It's not that everyone has to keep their eyes open, but you as the facilitator, you know, just, just keep an eye on, on what the Lord's doing uh, and how the person is responding. And bless what God is doing. If you, if you begin to see the Holy Spirit manifest and you're not sure what to do, just start thanking. Lord, thank you for what you're doing. This is a key when you're praying for healing. Uh, you know, Bobby will often say, has there been any change Maybe it's not 100%. Is, is there 10%? I mean, it may have to start small, but whatever measure there is, celebrate it. Thank the Lord for it, because then that opens the door for the Lord. He's saying, like, you see what I'm, thank you, you see what I'm doing. I'm going to do even more. So encourage people just to celebrate whatever measure of God's Spirit is moving uh, and, and to take time for that. And then, obviously, you, you just let uh, the prayers happen. If you need to... Uh, you know, come in and, and to, because it can go on. It's really up to you as a leader how much time, you know, you feel uh, that you want to give to it. But as you close it down, just like we do in praying for healing, ask the person then, so what's God doing? You know, what, what are you hearing? Is there something that, that has been prayed or said that you really feel like, you know, is really hitting you? And just give them an opportunity to respond. Uh, and again, if it's physical healing, do you feel any change? Yeah, something happened in, in my knee. It's just getting warm. Uh, but if it's not totally healed, go back to prayer. Don't be afraid to pray again, you know, if, if you feel like God's not, not quite done. But ask the person uh, what's being ministered to. Discuss anything that needs to be done. If there's something that, that's shared that uh, maybe needs some follow-up, uh, you know, you want to, that, that person, you want them to feel empowered, that they get up from that chair full of faith, if there is, if it was a prayer for wisdom or for counsel, you want them to feel empowered that they know the next step. They know what to do. And so just discern that because you really want them to, to be empowered, uh, which is the most important point. The person with the need believe that they have heard from God. They have direction. They've been healed. They have peace. Uh, everybody gets ministered through praying even for only one need because when the gifts of the Spirit start happening, uh, everyone gets touched by that. And oftentimes, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but uh, I, I see it where a word will be given, a prophetic word will be given, and whoever's giving it thinks it's for that person you're praying for, but it's actually not. It's for someone else that's standing there. I've received some prophetic words that way where they're praying for someone else and like, that is for me. And so, you know, again, celebrate that. Uh, and even you might want to open it up, you know, so what was the Lord doing with the rest of you? You know, did the Lord speak to anyone else as we were praying for so-and-so? Uh, and we might be, able to be really surprised uh, to see what is happening. So this, to me, is the fun part of one anothering. Uh, 
because Holy Spirit loves the freedom to, to move through each one of us. So. Yeah. That's really cool, especially when I told her two minutes before she did this, she was going to do this. So she did really good, didn't she? I thought so. Yeah, for sure. Just uh, highlighting one thing there. You know, traditionally what we've done in groups is we've taken prayer requests and then one person prays. This is not that. I'm not saying that that's not good and doesn't have its place, but this is really uh, identifying one need, gathering around, hearing Holy Spirit, getting feedback from the person. It's just at a different level than getting prayer requests and one person praying. Again, I'm not saying that's bad. This is just a different way of looking at things, okay? Um, so we're going to practice here in a little bit, but I ran across this, um, it's Bethel Healing Room's core values, and I, I thought it was really, uh, really appropriate just to kind of look down through those, and then we're going to uh, practice here in a few moments. But I really, I really like the statements here that, uh, that I wanted to remind us of, and I'm just going to go over them real briefly. It's always God's will to heal as demonstrated by the life of Jesus. God is always good, and he is in a good mood. God's presence is our atmosphere for ministry. That's a good one. We focus on the answer, not the problem. You see, today we live in a world that focuses on the problem. We are inundated with the problem. But God's way is we focus on the answer, not the problem. In God's presence is fullness of joy. Nothing is impossible. The answer, Jesus is always bigger than the problem or its cause. There's the faith element. Jesus' blood paid for everything. It's impossible to pray and nothing happened. It's impossible to pray and nothing happened. It's all about Jesus and the finished work of the cross. We pray, here's a good one, we pray from heaven to earth as sons and daughters. That's a good one. We pray from heaven. We're seated in heavenly places. That's where we need to contextualize ourselves, put ourselves there. Ministry operates out of personal intimacy with God. The more you and God have something personal going on with you, the more you're going to see the one anothering come out and God's going to be glorified. There's no formula. Take risks. Take risks. There's no formula. Stay hungry for more breakthroughs. And I added, as you give thanks. You've probably heard me share the pendulum, the clock pendulum. You've got a, you've got a big pendulum clock that's swinging. On the one side is being hungry. On the other side is thanksgiving. And if you stay on the side of thanksgiving, sometimes you're not hungry. And if you always stay hungry, then you forget to give thanks. And you've got you've to work your life with this pendulum clock. Staying hungry, giving thanks, staying hungry, giving thanks. And always honor guests with love and respect. You always, in these settings, you, you want to hear what God is saying. And, and God is, in public settings like this, not pointing out people's sins in public settings. He may do that in private settings, but not public settings. God is giving people an opportunity to see themselves at a different place that he is doing for them, not causing them to introspect and say, I've got to get some sin out of the way so that God can really work in my life. There's a place for that. I'm not discrediting that, but not in a public setting. God wants to see you, who he's taken you into, not where you're at. Because most of the time, people know where they're at, which is not a good place. So why add to that? This is where God can take you. Give them a vision for where God can take them, rather than agreeing with what they already agree with. I'm a rotten individual, and I messed up royally. God can take you out of that. Here's what he wants to do. Let's be people that move forward. 